All right, this is the verse we did a few days ago. And if Christ has not been risen or raised, then our, remember what Paul went everywhere he went, he was doing this. Preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Yep, that's what he said. Pointless and useless if he still did. And then he said, do not be misled, deceived. And then he gave this proverb. Wrong kind. Bad company does what to good morals? Corrupts them or ruins them. Yep. So watch out who you hang out with. They can influence you to do make decisions you will regret. And today's verse is from the Old Testament. Joshua. Have not I commanded you? Be, do you know this verse? Not weak, but strong and of a good. This means no, that's a good guess. Uh, it's got to do with bravery. Courage. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not. No, that's a good guess too. Uh, it, it really means the same thing as kind of not having this. If you don't have courage, you're probably going to be. Uh, afraid. Uh, afraid. Yeah, very good. And sometimes you're, you have you have fear, but you still have courage. I'm, I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive. You can be afraid and still be courageous. Be strong and have good courage. Be not afraid. And then this word rhymes with afraid, but it means like to really be, oh no, oh no, everything's going bad. You know, it's, it's <coughs> we don't use this word very much today, but it means to be uh, just kind of they're like, oh no, what are we going to do? Everything's going wrong. Uh, starts with a D I S, and it, and, it, and it rhymes with afraid. Dis, dismayed. dismayed. Yeah, yeah, dismayed. Be not afraid, need to be dismayed. For who? The, the Lord your God. Yes, the Lord your God. I will let you, but please, please, please don't let this be a habit, okay? I mean, it really is important for me for you to be in here, okay? Okay. All right, all right. Thanks for telling me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to reevaluate that whole thing. I've already said that before, so I've got to just haven't had a chance to do it yet. All right. For the Lord your God is where? Yeah, but, but it's shorter with you. And then this is kind of adding up. You, you may not stay in the same place, so you want to guess what that is? Wherever you wherever you go. Yeah. Now, I use the King James Version of this. AV, British Foreign Authorized Version, they call it in, in Britain. Because that's the way I memorized it originally, and, and a lot of people have memorized it that way, and I just put it in as King James. Notice the King James phraseology. You know, I almost never say the. <laughs> I say you. Even when I'm reading the King James, I started that a long time ago when I used almost exclusively the King James. I would read it like this. Have not I commanded you? It just My brain just says you when I say thee. Uh, instead of saying, we don't say neither be thou dismayed, we might say, and don't be dismayed, neither be dismayed. So I just skip that word, neither be dismayed. That's just the way I say it. For the Lord I don't say thy God, I say the Lord your God. That's just the way we talk now. For the Lord your God, 1611, they said thy. I say your. For the Lord your God is with you. I don't say whithersoever, I say wherever. I don't say thou, I say you. I don't say goest, I say go, wherever you go. Does that make sense? You see what I'm doing? So I kind of I kind of change the King James way of saying things into contemporary English when I read it. There are a few people around who think the King James is kind of holy the way it's written uh, because they were raised, you know, this is God's word, so this is the way God speaks. But, but you know, Paul didn't speak that way. He didn't even know English. Paul spoke Greek and maybe Aramaic, you know, but, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, that, this, this, is, this is basically 1611 English. But, and a lot of people spoke English this way in the 16 and 17 hundreds. But not many people speak that way this today. So it's not really holy. It's just the way they spoke in the 1670s when the King James translation happened to be translated. So I think it's good to speak it in English that people understand. 
So he's telling Joshua, let me give you the, the, the context here real quickly. Moses is dead. He was the greatest leader Israel ever knew. He led them out of bondage in Egypt. He led them through the Red Sea. God opened the Red Sea so they could get through. He led them through the wilderness and finally led them right up to the promised land. And God told Moses, you can't go in. I'm going to have your, your next man go in. So your, 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 your assistant, Joshua, is going to be the one that leads them, leads them in. Moses had to die, and it was because he had rebelled against God himself one time when he, God said, speak to the rock, and Moses got angry and struck the rock, and God said, I don't want that, that example to hold, so I'm going to let the people know I'm giving you a punishment for that, and that is you can't go into the promised land. Now, Moses was 120 years old by then, which doesn't mean like a man today would be 120 years old. He was still pretty strong. In those days, they lived longer and, and had stronger lives. But uh, he didn't get to lead it in. So Joshua is leading them in. And the book of Joshua tells us about that. Tells us about after Moses died, what happened. And Joshua leads them in. So in the very first chapter, verse 9, God appears to Joshua because Joshua is probably terrified. He's going to be God's man. He's got to replace Moses of all people, the greatest man that they'd ever had, the greatest man they ever knew. And, and, and God says, you're going to lead them into the promised land. And Joshua's feeling like, Lord, I'm not up to this. And so God says, yes, you are. He com and he, he appeared to Joshua. And he gave him these and some other words. So he says, he says basically, look, I, I'm the one commanding you. I'm the one leading you. And I've already told you this. I've commanded you this already. Be strong. Be of good courage. Don't be afraid, Joshua. Don't be dismayed. Don't think, oh, no, what's going to happen? Oh, no, this is too much for me. Don't, 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 don't think like that. Because I'm the Lord and the Lord your God. I'm with you wherever you go. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to stand over here on this side of the Jordan River and say, okay, Joshua, go get him. I'm going with you. God says, wherever you go, I'll be there. Now, God gave that to Joshua, but he put it in his book so that we could have it too. And it's important for command for us. There are times when we tend to be afraid. There are times when we don't like what's happening around us. There are times when we think this is too much for me. Right? You with me, TJ? Yeah. So, so there are times when we feel like that. God says, don't worry. Don't be a, be of good courage. Be strong. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why? Because I'm not going to leave. I'm not going anywhere. You wake up in the middle of the night feeling overwhelmed. I'm right there. God says, "I'll be with you. I'll be with you for whatever you're going through." So let's see if we can memorize it. Have not I commanded you? Have not I commanded you? Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. 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 Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Neither be dismayed. Be not afraid. Neither be dismayed. Be not afraid. Neither be dismayed. It helps a little bit that those words rhyme. Be not afraid. Neither be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God. For the Lord your God. For the Lord your God, for the Lord your God is with you. For the Lord your God is with you. For the Lord your God is with you. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, wherever you go, wherever you go. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'll help you if you get stuck. Have not I commanded you? Be what? Be strong. Be strong and have a good courage. Very good. Good. Be not afraid. Don't be dismayed. Very good. Be not afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you. Wherever you go. Amen. Good job, guys. Appreciate that. All right. Anything you want to say before I pray? Lord, thank you for these guys. Lord, you know how frustrated I am sometimes with this class because so many people come in late or don't come in at all. And it's frustrating to me. So I pray for them and I pray for me. I pray I'll have a right attitude. And I pray I'll make good decisions about this, Lord, about this class. So please help us. Pray. I thank you for these guys, though, Lord. We're here, and you're here, and you're not going anywhere. So I pray you'd help us to be teachable today. Help us to learn what you want us to learn about the spiritual warfare that we're involved in. Lord, we know Satan and his demons would love for us to ignore them. And you commanded us not to ignore them, but to resist them and to stand against them and put on your full armor. So I pray that we will learn these lessons well today. And You'd be in charge of us, and you'd get glory this, this morning uh, as we look at these things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um.
I think I have a handout. I should have already got it ready, but it's probably put it at the top. Um, here's a handout for you, and I've got. Um, um, so let's look at these questions real quickly here, and then I'll play the video. Let me see how long this is. Uh, who are our enemies? Who are not our enemies? Uh, why do some people seem to despise Christians and consider us to be their enemy? Uh, for, there's four, uh, number four, how does Jesus tell us to treat our enemies? Uh, number five, why are some Christians embarrassed to talk about Satan and his demons? Uh, number six, what did Jesus say about the world's reaction to his followers? Uh, number seven, does the world suddenly start liking us if we try to be nice and soft pedal parts of God's word? Number eight, what did Paul tell Timothy to expect as a follower of Jesus? Number nine, what did Jesus say in Luke 10 about our power over spiritual enemies? Number 10, what did Paul tell the Corinthians about our spiritual weapons? Number 11, at what levels and circumstances is spiritual warfare happening? And number 12, why is the Christian life so difficult and painful at times? 13, what did Paul conclude when God refused to take away Paul's thorn? 14, what does God teach us about self-control or self-discipline? 15, how do some Christians try to delegate things back to God? You know what delegate means? Delegate, if you've got a boss and a job, they will delegate to things to people, which means he knows he can't do everything. So he says, you do this, you do this, you do this. That's called delegation. So when you assign people things to do, it's called, and God assigns a lot of things to us to do. He could certainly do it, but he assigns it to us to do it because he wants us to learn some things. And then uh, number 16 says, what are two possible ditches that people can fall into? And I talk about spiritual ditches there. So, well, hey guys, thanks for joining me for another Veritas 2020 video as we begin to look at this extremely important topic that we call spiritual warfare. In the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we read these words, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You've probably already noticed we're living in a time when the enemies of biblical Christianity are becoming bolder than ever in my lifetime, I think. And I've, I've lived several years now. But that fact carries many implications for those of us who are true followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the implications that I want us to focus on today is the fact that the spiritual war that we find ourselves in the middle of, it's not a matter of what we choose, it's just where God has placed us, but it's very, very real. Now, it's extremely important for us to realize, as the scripture we just got through reading makes very clear, we are not at war with other people. <laughs> no matter how much other people may, from time to time, despise us, or may try to shut us up, which they do from time to time, it's still true that people are not our enemy. Even if other people decided that they hated us, <laughs> and even if they decided they hate God, we still love them. Jesus said very clearly and explicitly in his Sermon on the Mount, we are to love people, even if they hate us. But I say to you, Jesus said, love your enemies even. Pray for those who persecute you. So that's the attitude we're supposed to have as Christians. So Ephesians 6 makes it clear that our true enemies are not people. They are wicked spiritual forces that make up the kingdom of Satan. That would mean Satan and his ranks of demons. And sadly, way too many Christians have not learned how to engage these enemies the way God commands us to engage them. Some people call themselves Christians or are even embarrassed to talk about things like this. You know, you start talking about Satan and his demons, they get embarrassed because they know the world just ridicules it. Well, the world's going to roll their eyes at it. And so they don't even want to talk about it, much less learn how to resist them. 
You know, they've heard secular people, unbelievers, laugh at the possibility that they're even real. You know what I'm saying, don't you? But again, we just have to keep reminding ourselves that when people seem to hate us, God says there are evil powers lying behind that hatred. The people themselves are really just blind. They're poor blinded pawns who are being used by our real enemy, who's the devil. So we want to make sure we keep that clear in our mind. Some Christians still seem a little surprised and amazed at the degree of hatred and antagonism and bitterness that's demonstrated toward us by sometimes politicians, sometimes television and movie producers and writers, sometimes leaders of other religions, sometimes leaders of popular movements in the country, sometimes other people in different cultural leadership positions. And sometimes it, it really can kind of take our breath away. We think, wow, it's amazing how blatant the opposition can be to clear biblical truth, and it's just amazing, especially when those same principles and those same truths seem to be so widely accepted or at least respected only a generation or so ago, not that long ago, not when you're as old as I am. It seems like recent history. Well, the solution for some Christians is to try to downplay the truths that seem to make these people angry. We're all kind of wired like that. We have to be really careful. Why? Because we want people to like us, right? Don't you want people to like you? I want people to like me too. We want the people to realize, hey, we're really nice people. We're we're not mean. (laughs) But ultimately, guys, listen, this is hard to believe sometimes, and it's hard to accept. But we've got to understand it will never, ever work to just try to be so much like the world that they will think, oh, these are nice people. Yes, we better be nice people, nice in God's sense, kind, gracious, loving, but that means speaking the truth. And if we intend to be true to Jesus and true to God's word, we can expect some resistance. You know what they did to Jesus for being the truth and speaking the truth? They crucified him, right? You know what they did to Paul for proclaiming the truth everywhere he went? Yeah, they beheaded him. You know what they did to Stephen for simply speaking the truth there in Jerusalem? Yeah, they stoned him. I mean, and you know what Jesus said? He said, listen, if the world hates you, just know that it's hated me before it hated you. <laughs> so we've got to keep that perspective. We've got to keep these truths in mind. We're not going to make our, be able to make ourselves pleasing to the world. So that really shouldn't be our goal. Paul wrote to Timothy just a little while, shortly before Paul himself was beheaded. He said, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, can you finish that? Will be persecuted. Everybody, he said. And that's because the real enemy, of course, who is the devil, he's very intent on doing anything he can to hurt God's people, to render us powerless and impotent, to get us out of the battle. And anybody who's not willing to submit to our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ will very often be an easy pawn for the devil to use. I mean, he usually finds it pretty easy to convince unbelievers that we Christians are the problem, right? (laughs) Couldn't possibly be their own sin, could it? Oh, no. (laughs) Satan's very crafty, very subtle, and very wicked and murderous. So, guys, take me seriously here. Take God seriously. We have a very real problem that we have to face. We're in the middle of a very real problem spiritual war. It's not a game. It's not play. It's not just some Christian activity. No, we're in a war. And it's very sad, but there are way too many Christians who just seem to have a sense of helplessness in the face of these enemies. But God's not left us here just to wring our hands while we say, whoa, woe is me. Why is everything going wrong? What am I going to do? No, he didn't put us here to whine. (laughs) He's given us weapons and he's given us commands to take the battle to the enemy, to resist him. (laughs) Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. These are metaphors for Satan's ranks, his demons, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why? Because he's given us weapons, and we're to use those weapons to get the job done. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians, "For for the weapons of our warfare, you hear that? The weapons of our warfare, we're in war, guys, are not of the flesh. They're not fleshly, they're spiritual, but mighty through God 
to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we also need to understand that this warfare is going on at many different levels at the same time. We need to be aware of this, and we'll fight the war at many different levels. For example, there's spiritual warfare going on at the national and international level all around the world. There's spiritual warfare going on in many states and many cities. There's spiritual warfare going on in churches and denominations. There's spiritual warfare going on in companies, businesses. There's spiritual warfare going on in schools, all the way from pre-kindergarten, all the way through elementary school, junior high school, high school, colleges, graduate school. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare going on in many homes and in many of our lives at a very personal level, just, just our own relationship to the Lord, our own personal lives, and our own hearts, and our own minds, and our own bodies. We're waging very intense battles against a ruthless, cruel enemy named Satan. And so many Christians desperately need help in knowing how to wage these battles effectively. Some Christians are just getting badly beaten up by the enemy. And sadly, in some cases, they prayed about it. Whatever their situation is, whatever the struggle is they're going through, they prayed about it a lot. And listen, don't get me wrong. I certainly believe prayer is incredibly important. We don't do enough of it. And it's part of our spiritual warfare. No question about it. But listen, guys, please don't miss this. Prayer is not the only weapon God's given us. And it's our responsibility to take him seriously when he tells us things in his word about how to fight the war so we can become more effective soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me point out one other thing that turns out to be pretty significant in our spiritual war. Now, this is important. Understand this. You understand God did not promise in his word that the Christian life would be easy. Right? You know that? Make sure you understand that there are going to be many, many challenges and many, many trials that we have to pass through, every one of us. And, of course, we have to realize he's using these things for many purposes. But ultimately, they're making us more like Jesus. And ultimately, one way or another, the problems that we have in life that we'd like to just be able to snap our fingers and get rid of, <laughs> they're really opportunities. When God lets us go through problems, he's giving us an opportunity. And so in that sense, it's like an unrecognized blessing. I know it's hard, but there's one reason God tells us so many times in his word, count it all joy when you're going through the tough times. Because many times, if God answered our prayer the way we wanted him to, exactly when we wanted him to, we would look back someday and realize that didn't help us get more like Jesus. It was to our long range harm. It wouldn't have brought God the most glory. And that's what we're all about, right? Bringing him the most glory. Let me give you a classic example of this in the Bible. You remember the problem Paul had that he called the thorn in his flesh? And he asked God to take it away. That's normal. We usually ask God to take it away. But we always say, but Lord, your will be done. You know what's best for me. And in that case, God would not take it away. We don't know what it was, but God left it there. Why? Well, he makes it clear. It was to keep Paul humble and keep Paul useful in God's kingdom. Let's just read that passage real quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at this. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul had been given incredible revelations. For this reason, look at this, to keep me from exalting myself, in other words, to keep Paul from spiritual pride, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you <laughs> for power is perfected in weakness and look how paul responds to that most gladly therefore i will rather boast what i will boast about my weaknesses that the power of christ may dwell in me <laughs> isn't that an awesome passage when we look back on this life from the perspective of eternity. And it won't be long. We'll all be there before you know it. And when we get there, it seems so brief. We're going to recognize that many circumstances of this life, which we would have done almost anything to change, were actually very important tools in God's hands to make us more like Jesus. So we acknowledge that. But with that in mind, there may be many other times when what God's really teaching us is how to engage in effective spiritual warfare. And sometimes he allows the problems to persist 
so that we will learn how to fight the enemy. And we'll look back and say, boy, if I just used all the weapons at my disposal, I could have had that victory a lot faster. (laughs) See what I'm saying? So the problem may be allowed to persist in order to teach us to engage in in effective spiritual warfare. That's at least one possible reason for some of the trials we go through. Remember, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Also, I'm sure you noticed that we've been given weapons with an S at the end. It's a plural word. And we need to use them all. In a physical war, if we were engaged somehow, our nation in a physical war, we wouldn't dream of just ignoring or laying aside some weapons that might help us win a victory. Well, it's even more important that we as Christians use all our weapons because we're in a far greater war. It's not just a physical war. It's a spiritual war raging all around us. And we need to use all the weapons. We live in a time when many Christian believers, unfortunately, have been kind of lulled into a sort of spiritual stupor, a kind of spiritual dullness, a a sort of a sleepiness, spiritually speaking. It's not easy to discipline ourselves. None of us enjoy discipline, do we? Even if we're in this world, in this physical world we're living in, you know, we have to discipline ourselves to do well in school or discipline ourselves to do well in sports and other kinds of activities. We know it requires discipline. And and just spiritual life is no different. It requires a lot of discipline. The Bible makes it clear. God makes it very clear in his word. Discipline is not an option. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians think it is. You know, when you listen to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, the last thing on the list was self-control or self-discipline. Remember that? (laughs) I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but you may have heard somebody say, you know what? I'm just going to let the Lord fight all my battles. And that sounds pretty spiritual, doesn't it? But we better be very careful here. There's a danger if you've listened to very much of what I've tried to teach before in Scripture, the Bible studies that I've done. There's a you know, there's a danger that we Christians have of being tempted to delegate back to God what he's commanded us to do. You see what I'm saying? If God commands me to do something, I can't just in prayer delegate it back to him. Say, Lord, you do it. God said, no, I've told you to do it. You see what I'm saying? Let me give you some examples of that. God gives us very clear instructions in his word for for how we're supposed to help and love a brother or sister who's fallen into sin of some kind, how we're supposed to what we're supposed to do to bring them back and to restore them. But that's not always easy. It's kind of unpleasant, maybe. And so we may wind up saying, well, it's not my place to talk to them. So, Lord, I'm just going to delegate that back to you. Would you bring them back to repentance? Would you work in their heart? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray like that. We need to pray that God would grant them repentance, but we have to be disciplined enough to do what he's told us to do. We can't just leave it all up to him. You see what I'm saying? Not when he's told us to do things. Same thing about witnessing or sharing Christ or soul winning. You know, we may be tempted to delegate that back to the Lord. Lord, uh, you know this person's lost, but it's kind of awkward for me to talk to them. So would you just work in their hearts and draw them back to you and grant them repentance and faith? Well, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying a prayer that God would work in their hearts. But we've got to do what God commanded us to do in terms of sharing his truth with others, proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples. See what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with praying. Don't get me wrong. We need to pray that way. But we just must never try to substitute praying for obedience to God's other commands. Prayer is not the only command he gave us. So in the same way, he commands us to wage spiritual war against the devil and against his demons. And prayer is part of that war. But we must not try to substitute prayer for obedience to his other commands. So I could say, Lord, I'm just going to leave all my spiritual battles in your hands. I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm going to let you drive off Satan for me. Well, okay, maybe as long as we don't try to substitute it for God's command for us to take up the full armor, put on the whole armor, take up the sword. You see what I'm saying? I hope that's clear. I'm repeating myself, I know. God requires that we be disciplined followers of Christ. Listen to some of his words here about the warning of the danger of being lazy and undisciplined. This is in Luke 21. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Self-control, self-control. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, just a physical award. But we, 
and imperishable, but we still have to exercise self-control. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Preparing your minds for action. That requires discipline, guys. You can't just sit and let it happen by osmosis. It won't happen that way. Look at this one. You're familiar with this verse, I bet. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So over and over again, God warns his kids, we are to be alert and we're to be self-disciplined and we're to be ready to engage the enemy in effective spiritual battle. So am I getting through? <laughs> effective spiritual warfare is not a matter of just sitting back and letting God do it. It's not a matter of just pushing the right buttons to get an instant fix. You know, it's not a matter of learning the right words to say to the Lord or whatever to just get an instant fix. It requires discipline, perseverance, thinking. God makes it very clear. Let me add one more thought here before I launch into some of the more specifics. If you've watched, again, many of my Bible studies, you'll know that I believe one of the most important principles in the Christian life is finding God's balance. We're walking through this life. God's got a straight and narrow path for us, but there are ditches on both sides of that path. And it's very easy for us to see the danger in one ditch and fall into the other ditch. And so we have to constantly make sure we're staying balanced. That, that comes through prayer, but it also comes through study and thinking and maybe letting other Christians help us. But I can imagine at least two ditches and extremes that can come with this material I'm sharing with you in this spiritual warfare series. On the one hand, it might be tempting for some people to say, oh my goodness, there's way too much stuff here, Steve. Give me something simple, okay? Just give me a little simple outline. Can't do it. In order to become an effective spiritual warfare, we've got to commit to a certain amount of discipline. So we're not going to accomplish much if we just say, well, I just look, give me something easy, okay? Just let me have an easy way. Give me a little card or something. <laughs> Listen, guys, most of life is like this. Requires some mental exercise, some mental energy, spiritual exercise, spiritual energy. The other extreme, though, might be a kind of, I don't know, you might call it legalistic bondage or something to what I'm sharing. You know, you, we can get kind of enslaved legalistically thinking, boy, I, I must not leave that verse out. If I leave that verse out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose the battle. Or if I, if I leave that little point out, I'm going to lose the battle. Uh, that's, that's not good either. You know, we, we, we can fall into a pattern, for example, if you really were to memorize a lot of the stuff, I'm going to be encouraging you to memorize. We can say the words without really thinking about what it means even. Have you ever known people that, that prayed the Lord's Prayer like that? You know, you can pray the Lord's Prayer or maybe the 23rd Psalm, some things you've memorized. You can sing wonderful hymns and great songs of praise without even thinking about what you're saying. You realize that? <laughs> so we're not just talking about rote stuff here. We're not talking about the kind of legalism that says, oh, I mustn't leave out that point or that point. What the, what the Holy Spirit's going to do as you in, internalize these things and get this in your heart and mind, He will bring up verses and thoughts and things that you need when you need them, as long as you've done the groundwork, you've done the disciplined work, so you're ready, so you're equipped. So look for God's balance here. Now, I just want us to look briefly at a couple of passages of Scripture before we stop today. We've already looked at some of this, and we're going to get into more detail in, in upcoming videos. But listen again to what God says about this subject. And remember, this is God's Word, guys. This is God's word. It's not something men made up. We need to take God very seriously. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you will extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That's God's word. So we're going to stop here today and pick it up here next time. Father, you know much better than we know what's going on in the spiritual realm around us. You know what Satan's doing and what his demons are doing. And Lord, we know you could stop them in an instant with a word. But you've commanded us to fight. You are using Satan to make us more like Jesus. And Lord, that's hard for us to understand sometimes and certainly hard for us to engage in the war. But Lord, you, we know that you've required us to do this. So Lord, please help us not to be lazy bums. Help us not to be lazy kids. Help us not to be so distracted by the things of the world that we don't have time to discipline ourselves, to get into your word, to learn these principles, to learn these truths, to memorize your scriptures so that we can wage an effective spiritual war. We want to be warriors that are effective. We want to be effective in the battle. And we want to stay in that battle until you call us home and we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So here we are, Lord, beginning this process of training and getting equipped for effective spiritual warfare. Help us to be disciplined. Help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to stay balanced and use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let me review a little bit here. Who are our enemies? Who are our enemies? Satan and demons. Satan and demons. Who are not our enemies? Huh? God certainly. Who else are not our enemies? The, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, people in general. He's, when Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, that's people. That's what he's talking about, flesh and blood. They're not our enemies. Spiritual enemies are our enemies. Now, guys, I, I, I had a question here. Let's see. The fifth one. Why are some Christians embarrassed? Some Christians never mention Satan, never mention the demons, and if somebody else mentions it, they don't want to talk about it. Why do you think that's true? Could be several reasons. What? Yeah, they could be scared. In some cases, they say, I don't want to scare about that. Uh, God didn't want us to be afraid of Satan. He didn't want us to be afraid of his demons. God says, I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. You don't have to be afraid of them. But that's a good answer, TJ. What else? What else? Why else might people not want to talk about Satan and his demons? Well, I'll just tell you, you could run out of time. A lot of people don't believe it. A lot, Satan has convinced a lot of people he doesn't exist. If he can convince you he doesn't even exist, then you're not going to fight him <laughs> because you don't think he's there. You just think, oh man, why is everything going wrong? I don't know. But, but you're not fighting Satan, and Satan is, is real. A, a lot of people are not sure whether he exists or not, but they just don't think it's cool to talk about it. You know, they think, well, educated, sophisticated. Uh, people, academic people, they don't talk about Satan and the demons. It's kind of, I don't like that subject. You know, they kind of cringe. You know what I'm saying? It just, just, just sounds like something maybe weird people would talk about or something. Well, if, if Satan can convince you that that's the case, you'll leave him alone. You won't fight him. That's true because you don't even talk about him. I, I'll never forget. This is a Southern Baptist convention. Now, I'm a Southern Baptist. How many of you are Southern Baptists? Any of you? You're, 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 you're in my church. You're not. Anyway, I'm Southern Baptist. Fit enough. And, and we Baptists pride ourselves on being people of the Bible. We believe the Bible. It's God's Word. We stand firm on God's Word. I went to a Sunday school conference. This was a long time ago, back in the 1970s. In Ridgecrest, North Carolina, had a lot of Sunday school workers, a lot of Sunday school teachers. I was a minister of education. I'd taken a lot of my Sunday school workers over there. 
and my director of the, of the Sunday school and, and I and maybe a few others were in a meeting with a guy talking about the gospel of Mark. I think it was. He was, he was talking about it. And this guy is supposed to be really important in the Southern Baptist Convention. And he got to a place about demons. And he said, now you're going to ask me, are demons real? And then he, he shocked me. He said, I don't know. He said, furthermore, neither do you. I thought, wow, here's, this guy doesn't believe the Bible. So I told my Sunday school director afterwards, we're going to talk to this guy. Come on. I was just a young guy myself. I'm back in the 70s. So he came with me, and I caught him as he was leaving the meeting, the guy that was a speaker. I said, sir, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. He said, you said you didn't know whether demons were real and neither did we. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, then that means you don't believe the Bible, right? Because Jesus said they're real. <laughs> and he, he got red in the face, and he sputtered a little bit, and he said, you're putting words in my mouth. And he walked off. He wouldn't talk to me. He didn't believe the Bible, and he didn't want me to confront him with that, you know. But there are a lot of people like that, guys. Don't don't fall in that trap. The demons are real. Jesus talked to the demons. Jesus told us they're real, and uh, and we got spiritual war to fight. So this is the introduction to that. Uh, take one of these, and uh, next time we'll get into the actual spiritual warfare. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, Father, thank you so much that not only have you told us Satan and his demons are real, but you told us how to fight them, and you've commanded us to fight them. And, Lord, it's embarrassing sometimes when I think about how many of your people aren't equipped. They don't know how to put on your armor. They just kind of want you to do it. They want to delegate it back to you. Well, Lord, we know that's foolish to delegate to you what you commanded us to do. So help us to be spiritual warriors. Lord, we call this class the Warriors of Christ for a reason, because we're in a war. We're in a battle. You've put us here, and you've given us armor. You've given us the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, shield of faith, all that all awesome armor, of course, the sword of the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for that. But help us to learn how to use these things to fight our spiritual enemies effectively. Father, I hate to see Satan and his demons taking advantage of so many people, not just here, but all over our world, but in our country, it's getting worse and worse. And, Lord, it has to be that, I think, Lord, you know the truth, but it seems to me there has to be this because a lot of, even your people don't know how to resist Satan anymore. They don't know how to fight him. They don't know how to take up your weapons. So I pray that you'd help us to learn this well in this class. Lord, I know that there are a lot of kids not showing up in this class, and that's probably part of the reason. Satan doesn't want them here. He certainly doesn't want them here what we, what we heard today, and so a lot of people are absent. And, and then when they watch the video, it'll be tempting for them just to let it play in the background and ignore it. So, Lord, show me what to do about that. I'm not sure what to do at this point, Lord. So give me wisdom. Maybe you could use Melissa to give me some wisdom. Or, but help me to understand the right approach to take. Because I know, and I know you know, that these kids need what we're talking about right now. And they need to take it seriously. So help us to take your word seriously in general. To, to, to take it as seriously as you do. Or you, you're serious about it. You wouldn't have given it to us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much that Jesus was willing to come and die for us. Not so that we could be lazy. Not so that we could just uh, have fun and then go to heaven when we die, but, Lord, so that we could be effective to bringing you glory, so we could be effective spiritual warriors. Help us, Lord, to do that well. Help us to stay in the battle. We do want to bring you glory. We pray you help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.